Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Project Baseball, Project Softball Walk Through the Hall of Fame virtual event. What I'd like to do right now is introduce you to Elon Weitzman, who will open things up for us. Thanks, Mark. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to a virtual tour of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Our response to this event has been overwhelming, and we thank you all for joining us tonight as we have our guests on Zoom from coast to coast and even international over in Israel. My name is Elon Weitzman, and I'm a proud member of the JNF USA Baseball Softball Task Force. I originally got involved with the task force last year because, to be honest, my wife works for JNF and told me about Project Baseball. But as I learned more about it and honestly was sold by Doug at a game in Brooklyn, uh, it became truly a passion project for me as opposed to what was is just a spousal commitment. Uh, it's been a tremendous experience and one that I'm excited to continue building on. So tonight I'm excited about our program. Uh, this evening it features live updates from Israel with our baseball and softball representatives. And then we will have a moderated program featuring our special guest, Josh Rawich, who is the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So now it's my privilege to introduce a man who has spread the joy of baseball across Israel. He's a true team player who has been volunteering to develop the game of baseball in Israel for more than 20 years. He's also a diehard Met fan uh, who occasionally will get up in the middle of the night in Israel to watch his beloved Mets. That goes better uh, than others sometimes. He puts together he put together the first ever Israeli team to compete in the World Baseball Classic, and he recently served as the general manager of Team Israel in last summer's Tokyo Olympics, which was the first time since 1976 that an Israeli team participated in a team Olympic sport. In addition, he's also the president of the Israel, baseball, Israel Association of Baseball. So baseball fans, please welcome live from Israel, Peter Kurtz. Thank you very much, Elon, for that great introduction. It's uh, 4 a.m. here in Israel, and it's 0-0. Max Scherz is pitching against St. Louis in the fifth inning. So any updates I can give you guys uh, as we're going along? Um, it's a pleasure being here, and I thank everybody at the JNF and Project Baseball. I really look forward to this, uh, this walk through the Hall of Fame with, with Josh. Um, we know him very well from his Diamondback days. We, we at Team Israel practiced quite a few times in Arizona, and also obviously from the WBC, which he was very much involved in. Um, I look forward to seeing some of the Team Israel memorabilia that's in the, uh, in the Hall of Fame, and hopefully Josh will take us there. Um, and I hope that there will be many, many other items that we can send to Josh in, in the future. Um, Israel baseball has grown a lot over the last 10 months um, since the Olympics, um, since our, 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 our appearance in the Olympic Games. We look forward to a very, very strong spring season. The last two years were difficult, 2020 and 2021, because of, because of COVID. Um, we had some practices, we had some games, we had some seasons that were it was on and off. But now we're hoping that, that things will be well for the spring, um, knock on wood. We're also sending four national teams overseas, two baseball tournaments to European tournaments uh, in Europe. Um, which is the first time that we're doing that, sending the four national teams. Um, the U23s are going to the, um, to the European qualifiers in Lithuania, um, where we do hope to win and get to the European Championship next year. We have a very strong team in the U23 category. Um, the U18 is going to the European Championship in the Czech Republic. Um, U15, for the first time, we're sending to Valencia in Spain. And the U12 team is going to the Little League Tournament, um, which is in Poland for the first time, um, where the winner goes to, to the tournament in the States. Um, I don't know if we're going to be winning because we don't have that strong a team in that category, but we'll, we'll be appearing there for the first time, and hopefully in the future we can do something. We're also be hosting in Israel this summer the uh, Maccabiat tournament, um, the U18 Maccabiat tournament. So very exciting times. A lot of things are going on. A lot of things are happening in baseball here in Israel. Um, but for those who know about baseball internationally, about Israeli base, Israel baseball internationally, um, just a little bit of re a review. Our first foray into the into the international world was back in 2012 in the WBC qualifiers um, in Jupiter, Florida. We lost to Spain in the qualifiers, unfortunately. Um, that team had a 19-year-old had a kid, a uh, single-A ball player uh, named Jock Peterson, um, who has since made a nice major league career in California, both in Southern California and today now in Northern California. Um, we were also, also Sean Green played for us. Gabe Kapler and Brad Ausmus were our managers. Um, who are both managing today, I guess, in Northern California, Gabe with the, with the, with the Giants, um, and Brad Auschwitz is the, is, the, uh, is the bench coach for, for Oakland. Fast forward four years to 2016, um, players like Jason Marquis, uh, Ike Davis, uh, Sam Fold, who had just recently retired, played for Team Israel in the WBC. Um, we, won the, we won the qualifiers in Brooklyn. We're the last team to qualify for the main WBC tournament. Uh, ESPN called us the Jamaican bobsled team. Didn't give us much of a chance at all, uh, but we proceeded to, to win all three games in the first round, defeating Korea 
Taiwan and the Netherlands, went to the next round, defeated Cuba, Cuba national team in the, in the WBC. Um, unfortunately, we lost the next two games. We came in sixth place uh, altogether. And we're looking forward now to the March 2023 WBC, where we are, are also now um, being able to put together, on paper at least, a really, really good Jewish baseball team that can play for Team Israel. Um, the WBSC, the World Baseball Federation, declared after the, after the WBC um, that baseball was back in the Olympics, what the qualifying situation would be like. Um, I sat with our manager at the time and I said to him, listen, uh, uh, Eric, you've got to win uh, four tournaments in a matter of two months um, in four different countries in Europe. Um, piece of cake. He looked at me, said, you're crazy, and, uh, but I'm with you. And uh, we went out and we recruited um, some of the players from the WBC team to make Aliyah, because uh, as opposed to the WBC for the Olympics, you need to have citizenship. Um, we ended up bringing in players like Danny Valencia, Ty Kelly, Jeremy Bleich. They actually came to Israel, were there with us, got citizenship, made Aliyah, um, were playing with the kids in Israel and represented us in, 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 the, in, the, in the Olympic qualifying tournaments. We went 17 and four in the summer of 2019, um, won all four tournaments and miraculously reached the Olympics. Unfortunately, because of COVID, that was delayed for a year. So we had Zoom calls every month. We tried to keep the guys together as much as possible. Uh, more guys made Aliyah, guys like, uh, like um, um, Brian LeVarnway made Aliyah, Josh Zide, and the, 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 the cherry in the cake uh, was Ian Kinsler, who made Aliyah just before COVID came in. He came to Israel. He's going to be coming in the summer, by the way, for the Maccabi Art Tournament as well. Um, he was a great, great uh, addition to our team. Unfortunately, in Tokyo, um, we lost our best pitcher uh, in the first inning on the seventh pitch, uh, uh, John Moscott. Um, we almost beat Korea. We lost to them in the ninth, in the tenth inning. We lost to the Dominican Republic in the ninth inning. Um, it was an incredible experience. We beat Mexico. We were the first Israel team to win a game in an Olympics um, in any sport, um, and that was a big honor. Uh, we came in fifth place, fifth place out of six teams out of out of 150 countries um, all over the world. So that was really an honor for us. A month later, we went to the European Championship again. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the Olympians could not come because they had already taken off three weeks for the Olympics. And we're not able to come to Italy where the European Championship was. So more than 50% of our team was made up of um, Israelis, Israeli Sabras, local kids who grew up here in the program, uh, learned baseball here in Israel. Um, I was a little bit uh, concerned about the team and what place we would be in, but we kept winning game after game after game. We reached the finals against, uh, against Holland and we came in second place. We lost to Holland in the finals and we came in second place. So I'm very, very proud of that team. Um, that was one of the greatest accomplishments of Israel baseball because we got the Sabres much more involved and much more going into the, uh, into the tournaments. In 2023, we're going again to the European Championship in the Czech Republic. And in 2025, we'll actually be hosting um, the games here, the, the, the championship here in Israel. Um, and that should be incredible. That'll be three, three and a half years from now, hosting 16 teams, the 16 best European teams. And we're really looking forward to that, to that, to that moment. Um, but the main thing that we've done over the last few years is an infrastructure. And that the JNF is, is really had, has been a huge part of this with Project Baseball helping to fund the, 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 the baseball team, both in its travels. Obviously, when you go to four different countries in Europe, you've got to bring 30, 35 people there. Um, there's a lot of expenses for travel, for camps, for training, for hotels. Um, the JNF has been great about that, but even more so about infrastructure. Um, and maybe we can show some of the, uh, the slides that we have now because um, we, we've opened up the new Renana field, um, which is open in Renana. Um, which is a nice field. Um, and that was all also sponsored by the JNF. But our main field is gonna be in Beit Shemesh. Here you can see pictures of the of phase one, which happened in the last, over the last two months. Um, tractors going in there, it was, it was a real valley of a field. Um, they went in there, they, they bulldozed it down, they flattened up, up out, of, uh, out the whole area. Um, today we finished phase one. We're going into phase two now. Here you can see more of the, of the pictures there. We're going into phase, you can see the piping, the, it's a, it's a drainage area. It's a drainage area for Beit Shemesh. So all the water comes down there. So we had to put also drainage systems in there. Um, but phase two is already funded by the Israeli government. Um, they've given us money for phase two to make the actual field, to put lighting, to put stands in there. Um, and now we're raising money together with the JNF for phase three, um, which will be more um, amenities for the field, for the, the, the clubhouse, for the players, um, better amenities for the fans coming out there. Um, et cetera. So anybody who wants to raise money, to, to give money, to donate money, will be donating it for this project. Um, in addition, we're also working on the Tel Aviv field um, for the European Championship in 2025. This is the actual drawing of, the, of what the field will look like. 
um, for 2025, we need to have three fields. And the Tel Aviv field, the sport tech field, will be the main field for that tournament. Um, and we're looking to redo the Tel Aviv field so that it's a, it's a world-class field um, and can really hold. And we've already spoken to the Tel Aviv municipality, and they're giving their, their land for that. And we, we thank the JNF and Project Baseball and all the donors. And we hope that many people on this call will continue do to continue donating to the project. Um, now I want to introduce Ami Baran, who's uh, the executive director of, of Israel Softball. Um, they have their own championship goals, and we're running together side by side, um, working very closely together. And obviously, whatever baseball fields we build will also be used as, uh, as fields for softball. But right now, uh, go ahead, take it over, Ami. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I'd like really also to thank everybody here for joining us and also for allowing me to be here. Um, this is my first time that I've been on one of the JNF uh, shows. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little background of uh, what we've been doing in the softball area as pertaining to our, our national teams. Uh, we, too, have been uh, incorporating the uh, first step of uh, bringing in girls from the United States to play for our uh, national teams, uh, Jewish girls who've uh, made Aliyah. Uh, in the first step in 2019, actually, we did it in 2007 the first time, but it didn't really work out too much. We had 40 girls trying to make Aliyah, and it just didn't work out that time. But in 2019, we actually were able to get it going, and uh, 11 players, 11 players from all over the United States made Aliyah. And we were all we were preparing to get into the uh, European Championships. Um, it wasn't very easy, but at the end, when they all made their Aliyah, they received their passports. We had Israeli girls also on the team, Israeli-born players on that team. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, at the 2019 European Championships, uh, the ladies took ninth place. Those championships were the same championships that the baseball were going through to try to make to the Olympics, and our girls didn't make the Olympics, but we were really proud of our baseball uh, counterparts who made it. And I actually was there watching the games at the Olympics because I did make it to Tokyo and it was really incredible to see that. Um, our second stage went into 2020 where we started to gather a, a new group of girls uh, to make Aliyah. But as we all know, COVID uh, hit us pretty hard, <clears throat> but we were still able to uh, have a training camp in December 2020. We actually were able to have a training camp. We brought in some junior girls, under 18 girls. We brought in our senior uh, players, plus our Israeli girls who came also. And in Las Vegas, we had an incredible um, experience with all these girls getting together to, uh, to prepare for the 2021 uh, European Championships, which again was going to be held in, uh, in Europe. Um, in 2021, um, we started to move forward and we actually were starting to build up an under 22 team, under 22 and a women's national team, again, based on the players that were making Aliyah. Some of our 2019, seven of our 2019 players actually um, made it back to play with us. They were our returnees. We had seven new players. Some of the others couldn't come, so they stayed in the United States and continued with their jobs or whatever they needed. And we had some other Israeli girls who were who made the team also. Um, in the European Championships there, we actually took fourth place. It was the first time ever for um, a women's national team in Israel, by the way, and any of the team sports to actually get to the fourth place. So we were also making a small history. We were recognized by the Olympic Committee here uh, in, in what we were doing. And in the end, um, I can say that 2021 was a really successful year, which also brought in more uh, inspiration towards other people around the United States who heard about us. And I started to receive uh, hundreds of emails of players who want to make Aliyah, who want to play for Israel's national teams to really help us expand and grow in Israel. Because in the end, that was part of the whole process that we wanted to get everybody involved so that we can build the sport in Israel. Uh, we do it, by the way, along with baseball. We, we are side by side with the baseball and softball. We, we play at the same stadiums uh, or stadiums, our, 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 our fields that we play at. And uh, we continue to do that all the time. Um, in 2021, December, actually, we had another training camp. Uh, this time we did it in LA. Um, and we are preparing now for the 2022 European Championships, uh, which will be held in Spain. And our women are working really hard. We have a bunch of the players who are playing in college, as you'll hear 
pretty soon after I speak. We'll be talking to Arizona. Um, I will say that we have our under-22 uh, European Championship also in the Czech Republic, and we do have uh, prospects who are coming to that tournament too from, his, from the United States and making Aliyah. Um, I would like to mention that we have also um, begun a program in the United States, and I've already have parents and teams of under 13, under 18 players who are searching, searching for, you know, to searching for their Jewish heritage and uh, literally trying to get on this team for the national team for, for Israel to, to, um, to join us. I think that the biggest concept that we've had here and the best part of this uh, whole process was what came out of it in the end. I've been asked, what, is, what, what are we doing? We're bringing these players over here and we're, they're, they're feeling with their Jewish heritage. I think that if you're going to hear the next speaker after me uh, is going to be Arizona. And I think, um, I don't know if we can maybe later send out her article which, uh, that was written about her. It was very impressive. And it was just something that touched me and touched all the people that have been involved in this. Because in the end, this is what it's really all about. And I truly believe that uh, this is going to work for, go forward. Uh, JNF, like uh, Peter said, has been so helpful with us. We've been raising the funds for this. The, the, the ladies have been online trying to get friends and people to donate to help us get to those situations. Building the fields, as Peter said, there's the Ranan and Beit Shemesh. There are other smaller fields that need to be built around Israel, which are also part of the program. It's just one big program, which we all believe uh, on the baseball and the softball side that this is going to really work. And um, I'm really hoping for a really great future for all these players and um, feeling that making Aliyah for them and becoming part of us is going to be something that'll be uh, staying with them for a lifetime. I'm going to introduce now uh, Arizona, Arizona Ritchie, one of our national team players. Um, I think that would be a good sign for you, Arizona, to get in there and just tell them how you feel about it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ami. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Arizona, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself and why I made Aliyah. Um, so I'm originally from Stafford, Virginia, but I currently live in Charlottesville, where I'm about to graduate from the University of Virginia and where I also play softball. Um, and I'm also about to participate in my second summer um, on the Israeli national team. Um, which has been just one of the coolest and biggest honors of my life. Um, and we, as Ami said, we made an awesome run last year, um, last summer, coming in fourth at the European Championships, made a little bit of history. It was a great experience. Um, but aside from being able to play softball uh, at the highest level, the Israeli national team gave me the opportunity to make Aliyah and officially become an Israeli citizen, which is a dream come true and honestly something I never thought for myself beforehand. Um, so aside from the softball part, I really chose to play for Israel and become a citizen because it ties me to my culture, um, my religion, my family, um, and overall, it just really, really strengthens my connection to my Jewish identity. Um, and I'll expand on that in just a second. But first, I want to just give you a little bit of background. Um, I grew up in a Jewish conservative home um, in Virginia. I became bat mitzvah, did all the good stuff. Um, and I was always just really, really aware of my Jewish identity from a young age. Um, and I think probably more so because I live in a not so Jewish populated area. Um, and I think that this really guided me in having a lot of pride in my Jewishness. Um, and I was always wanting to show it off. I went to school with um, my sister and we were the only Jewish kids in my high school. Um, so when I was given the opportunity to join um, Team Israel, it really just gave me a way to show off that Jewish pride, um, which is something that just really drives me and motivates me in life. Um, and I think that that's really important for our people, um, because as we all know, the Jewish people have faced so much adversity through history, um, and that obviously continues today. 
So for me, joining Team Israel and becoming a citizen um, is more than just the softball aspect. Um, it's about representing my family and our great culture and honestly, those who came before us and didn't necessarily get to have the same opportunities, but sacrificed a lot to give us those opportunities. Um, and so during the month or so that I was in Israel um, last summer, I gained lifelong friends, um, sisters really, I would call them. And Israel really quickly came to feel like my home, um, which all the girls talked about. We were like, wow, this is insane. We just like feel so comfortable here, so at home. Um, and so that's just a little bit of my story. And I hope you guys can follow along with Team Israel this summer as um, we'll be playing in Spain for the European Championship. Thank you. Thanks, Peter, Arizona, and Ami for the updates. My name is Stuart Sokoloff, and I'm a proud member of the JNF USA Baseball and Ta Softball Task Force. And the reason I got involved is because on my birthright trip to Israel a, few, a number of years ago, I saw two young kids playing and throwing a baseball with their baseball gloves. And it took me a second to realize that that's not normal for, for Israelis. And I made a point at that point to commit myself to do everything in my power to increase the footprint of baseball in Israel. And this was before I knew about this task force. And I've, I've worked for a number of professional sports teams. I work in baseball now, and I've seen how firsthand how sports can not only impact a person, but a community as a whole. And in Phoenix, where I've lived for most of my life, the Suns as making the playoffs right now is a perfect example. Everyone rallying around the hometown team to go on that playoff run. I was fortunate enough, along with Peter, to be with the Olympic team, at least for me, three weeks prior to the Tokyo Olympics last year. And when I arrived for, at, to, at the ballparks for games, just seeing the fans come in and coming and rallying around and bringing their community around the team, it was, it was crazy to see how one group of people can impact a whole community that we didn't even know existed. Um, so... At this time, I'd ask you if you consider a donation to Project Baseball and Softball, you should have received a text on your phone with a donation on how to donate. The money donated tonight will be going to help the next phase of USA Baseball Field and Beit Shemesh, as you've seen on the pictures that Peter had mentioned. And we'll be going to the, U, the women's softball team to help sub subsidize the national team and the under-22 teams who are playing in the European Championships in the Ju June and July. Our goal is to have 100% participation tonight. And we also have some great merchandise for, from both the teams offered as an incentive for your donation. Doug, do you wanna start? I uh, will pick up here. Um, thank you, Alon, Peter, Ami, and Stuart, and certainly Arizona, because um, because of Lou in the fall of 2015, I got recruited to be a part of what was then called Project Baseball, and I come from the softball side of it, so now we, we represent things on both sides. Uh, but since that time, I have absolutely been blessed to watch historic achievements on both softball and baseball sides through my work with JNF USA in support of Team Israel. And ultimately, my two proudest moments were watching a very undermanned and mostly Israeli grown baseball team last fall compete in the European Championships to silver. Uh, and I don't know how much people know about what it took, but these were. I believe 10 Israelis and seven, um, seven Olim that actually went uh, on a 25-man roster. There were only 17 players who laid it all out there to, to win. My softball side proudest moment was Ami asking me to come out to Cal Southern California for a camp last December. And in the midst of three days of torrential rains, um, we had to cancel the umpires that I set up to help a Wednesday scrimmage game between our women's national team and under 22s. I showed up Tuesday afternoon, dusted off an umpire uniform that I haven't worn in 12 years, and went out there and worked a game that to me became more important than working the plate on a state championship game in Arizona, than working 
national championships and working Special Olympics World Games. As much as I love supporting all of my causes, I will tell you that I just up my subscription to the Baseball Hall of Fame in the midst of other contributions that we might give. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, it cost me stepping it up because I thought I was going to have a baseball, a National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum shirt to wear on this thing. So I'm, I'm going to represent baseball and softball through through this. But very honored to introduce my friend Josh Rawich today who became the eighth president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum uh, last September. Uh, Josh spent the last 28 years working in baseball, including the last decade in Arizona, and uh, working for the Diamondbacks is how I met Josh. Josh has become, and he was the team's senior vice president of content and communications, um, but he spent years with the Dodgers growing up in Southern California, um, doing player relations, player media relations, corporate communications, broadcasting, content production, social media, uh, in-game entertainment, spring training, all of the things that, that has brought him to this amazing opportunity to be the president of the Hall of Fame. Um, from everything that I know, I will just tell you um, his accolades are at a high level of this work in 2018. He received the Robert Official Award for Public Relations Excellence, which is given annually to an industry executive who excels in promoting the game. Um, he was there when Team Israel in Korea swept the first three games and moved on to the semifinal round. Um, he is a global representative of baseball, which um, I believe is part of the reason that he had such support in receiving this particular position. Graduate of Indiana University, received bachelor's degree in sports marketing and management, minor in business. During the time with the D-backs, he taught strategic sports communications at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Um, I can only tell you that the thought of moving from Arizona to Cooperstown, New York is not the easiest thought. And for his wife, Erin, uh, kids, Emily and Braden, uh, canine child, Indy, um, adjusting from a major metropolitan area to Cooperstown, New York is a really big adjustment. I will, um, I'm going to turn this over to him, but I'm going to let you know also that if you would like to ask questions with time permitting at the end and to get as many of those questions as we can get in, um, please put them in our chat. So there's a chat button at the bottom. There are already three items in chat that I can see, but just if you'll type your questions in there, I will turn this over to Josh for his presentation, his walk through the Baseball Hall of Fame. And when we get done with that presentation, we'll go to question and answers. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate you guys all uh, your support of JNF and, and being on here tonight. Uh, for anybody on the East Coast, I know it's gotten a little late, so try to get through this quick and then let you guys ask some questions. But really what I'm hoping to do today is give you just a tiny little taste of what it's like to be here in Cooperstown and see the Hall of Fame through the eyes of a Jew, or in this case, I guess the Jewish president of the Hall of Fame. Um, so we'll, we'll start with um, the, the next slide here. Um, and if you click to the first photo, I should say I've had the good fortune of, of visiting Israel back in 1997. I was end of my senior year in, or junior year in college. I was studying abroad and uh, I was backpacking through Europe with my brother. We ended up in Israel with my parents. And I would say that really it, this was probably the moment where I felt the closest to my religion at any point in the first 40 years of my life. I should apologize, by the way, for the baggy jeans, but that was in fact, uh, I think in style back in the day. So nonetheless, that was probably the moment where I felt um, really the closest to being Jewish prior to this next photo here. There you go, it is time to visit again, Peter. Um, so obviously you've heard everybody talk about the improbable run in 2017 in the World Baseball Classic. And I was fortunate enough to be the, the what they called the venue press chief in Seoul uh, at the Wukasong Stadium there. and. Um, you know, or I think it was the Gochuk Dome, sorry, confusing my stadiums in Asia, but um, I was down on the field as they were getting ready for the national anthem. Um, and 
honestly, this this moment to me was probably one of the coolest moments of my entire quarter century plus in baseball. As as they were starting to play Hatikva, uh, all of the players took their hats off and they were wearing kippot. I don't know if you can see it closely enough in there that that was the case, but um, it was a pretty unbelievable moment. Um, for any of you who haven't seen the the film uh, Heading Home, it's an incredible documentary on that. I actually have a I have a line in there. I'm not actually on on screen. You have to pick up my voice off camera. But um, this was truly I, I get chills still when I think about that moment. I think about what it meant and um, and just the, the feeling I had of my Jewish heritage. And you, you hear Arizona talk about it. I certainly know in Cooperstown where there's probably not may, maybe a few more Jews than where you grew up, Arizona, but um, not a whole lot more. So um, as I watch this team go on and they wound up really, as, as everybody's explained, kind of going on this. David and Goliath sort of run. Um, if you take a peek at uh, the third from the left, there's a guy wearing number 28 over there. That's Josh side. And you see him holding his, his hat. There you go. We got even got a pointer. I love it. Thank you. Um, so that's, uh, that's Josh. He's got his hat behind it behind his back. And if you click the next slide, um, you'll see that that is now a, a piece of our collection here in Cooperstown. Um, it was donated by him and, and to kind of commemorate team Israel's run. And, and what we really try to do in, in, in the Hall of Fame is we preserve history. Um, he earned the win that night. He knocked, he helped the team knock off Korea. And so uh, over the next, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes, I'm going to try to give you just a tiny taste of some of the artifacts. We have more than 40,000 three-dimensional artifacts in our collection, but um, we'll give you a little, a little flavor of them um, and those that tie here to, to Jewish history and Israel and whatnot. So I'm going to Stick with our international theme here on the next one. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Mo Berg, if the name Mo Berg means anything to any of you. Um, he was a catcher in the big leagues for about 15 years. Not known for being one of the best players in the big leagues. He was, he was often referred to as the smartest guy in baseball. And Casey Stengel, they say, described him as the strangest man to ever play baseball. But this is a guy who went to Princeton. He went to Columbia Law School. He spoke several languages, uh, was known for, for reading 10 newspapers a day long before you could just get them online. Uh, and ultimately, he was a spy for the United States, which is pretty unbelievable. The, the stories of him traveling to Japan and Yugoslavia and Italy and several other places. Um, he was eventually employed by the CIA. And you can actually read a little bit. There's a book about him called The Catcher Was a Spy. But this this catcher's mask here belongs to him. And um, they said the, the what I've learned in kind of doing a little bit of my research on him was that uh, when he died in 1972, according to the nurse who was at the hospital, hospital, his final words were, how did the Mets do today? Um, pretty amazing that that's somebody's final words and and uh, his remains were actually cremated and spread over Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. So that's a, a pretty cool artifact, his catcher's mask from back in the day. On the next slide, um, you obviously hear a lot about the five Jewish Hall of Famers, uh, five people with plaques on the walls who are Jewish. Uh, many of you probably know about Hank Greenberg, um, not the first, uh, not the earliest Jew, I should say. He might be, I think he was actually the first to be enshrined, but um, He's the only Jewish hitter to actually have a plaque on the wall here in Cooperstown. And we have several of his items, including this is his 300th home run baseball that was hit in 1946. And then if you slip, clip to the next slide here, if we're going to talk about the, the best hitter, uh, best Jewish hitter in baseball history. Of course, you think about the best Jewish pitcher in baseball history. And this is actually Sandy Koufax's glove. But um, we have several actually really cool artifacts from him. Um, we have a hat from one of his no hitters. We've got several other really unique uh, items. But as I was trying to kind of separate a little bit, um, some of these from the next, somehow we ended up with his high school glove from 1953, Lafayette High School, um, which is where he actually went to high school with uh, Fred Wilpon, the former owner of the Mets. They may come up a couple times in here. But um, when you think about at, at that point in his career, he was he was just getting, I mean, the whole his whole life ahead of him. And the idea that he would be a bonus baby and eventually wind up becoming one of the greatest, one of the greatest left-handers in the history of the game, and certainly the greatest left-handed pitcher. Um, it's pretty cool that that's uh, in our in our collection here at the Hall of Fame. So we're going to keep going here. There were there were plenty of Jewish players between Sandy Koufax and our current times, including uh, I know many of you know the the first ever designated hitter. Ron Blumberg was uh, had a book called Designated Hebrew. If you're looking for another good read, but um, this is a mod this is a more modern artifact in our collection. Um, this is actually from Alex Bregman. It was uh, in 2018 when he was uh, one of the one of the all stars. He actually won the MVP award in in Washington D.C. 
And uh, he hit the game-winning homer in the 10th inning. This is the bat that he used to do it. And he donated it to the Hall of Fame right after that game. So I will, uh, as we get a little bit, a little couple minutes in, I'll explain to you how we get these items to come here. But as we keep going here into modern times, you hit the next slide. And this was the most, one of our more recent artifacts from a, a Jewish player. This is actually from this past October. Um, actually, Alex Bregman in, early in, in the World Series faced off against Max Fried in the World Series. And it's believed that when they faced each other in game one, that that was the first time that that two Jewish players, actually, I don't think it was game one. It might've been game two, but they believe it was the first time that two Jewish players ever faced off against one another in the World Series, which is actually just kind of hard to believe at this point. But, oh, and there's a little update about Max being playing in Israel as a 14-year-old, which is pretty neat. So a few days after uh, after he becomes the first pitcher to face a Jew, first Jewish pitcher to face a Jewish hitter, um, he gets to start game six of the World Series and he gets the win. Um, some of you out there in L.A. may know him as the local kid who went to Harvard Westlake. That's how I actually first heard of him. His high school coach was actually a teammate of mine in high school um, when I was at Chatsworth High out there in the Valley. And so oddly enough, after the World Series, we're standing down on the field and I'm sitting here talking to Max Fried about growing up Jewish in the San Fernando Valley and and who his high school coach was. And another one of our, our mutual friends is down on the field and mentions that we're both Jewish. And it just kind of made me laugh that, that, that I'm having this conversation with the guy who just won the, the last game of the World Series. Um, and we asked him, that was my job. We, we, de- we separated out who we were going to talk to. And I asked him whether he would donate the, the spikes from that night's game. And he was, of course, more than willing to. And so that's us down in the clubhouse after the game uh, as he's handing them over to us. So that's basically what happens when we when it's a current artifact. If it's a game, if it's a World Series or an all star game, we're on site and we can basically make our way down to the clubhouse and talk to the guys basically in that moment as they're coming out of the game or often we'll coordinate it literally within minutes of a major moment happening. Um, If it's a player, a coach, a fan, an umpire, we can do that sort of thing. Um, and that's how we actually got this next incredible artifact. If you click our next slide, uh, many of you uh, are aware Jock Peterson's name came up earlier on on this uh, this Zoom. And Jock, uh, we're basically we've collected all of our artifacts. We've we've probably gotten seven or eight things out of the Braves clubhouse. A couple of things out of the Astros clubhouse were were pretty much done. And we had kind of decided that even though the, the pearls had become a big story during the World Series, that we didn't think it was fair to ask Jock Peterson to to donate that because they're not cheap. This is this is not a, a pair of spikes that was provided to him by a supplier. He he, paid, he, he had to pay for this thing. So we, we've, we've basically decided um, we're not going to ask him. And, uh, and Jock is dressed and leaving the clubhouse. And I see him and I, I just, I, I really couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. So I kind of jokingly said, oh, hey, congrats, Jock, you know, back-to-back world championships. That's really cool. Hey, we were going to ask you for those, those uh, pearls, but we know they're real, so we wouldn't ask you for that. And he kind of laughed and walked away. And he took about 10 steps past us. And he comes back and he looks back at us. And he's like, wait, were you serious? Because at this point, these guys all realized that we were with the Hall of Fame and where they were going. And I said, I'm, I'm serious if you're serious. So he said, hold on a second. And he, he said, let me go call my jeweler. And he took off and he calls his jeweler. And he comes back and says, you know, my jeweler says he'll send me another set of pearls if you guys want this. And I said, we want this. So. We let him hang on to it for the parade. He this photo was taken a couple of days later when they when they uh, went through the streets of Atlanta, and then ultimately the actual uh, pearls showed up here in Cooperstown and are part of our Autumn Glory exhibit right now. So if you make your trip out here, you'll see it. So just a couple more I want to show you before I open it up. Let you guys have some questions because I'm sure there'll be plenty of them. Um, this next artifact here is particularly meaningful to me because it's Gabe Kapler's uh, cap from last last year at. Uh, at Pride Night for the Giants, but um, I actually went to Hebrew school with Gabe Kapler. We were in the same class together at Adada Riel there in the San Fernando Valley, for those of you that are in California right now. I've known him since the 80s, and um, he was a year ahead of me at Taft High School and played against my team at Chatsworth and and, uh, obviously went on to become a world champion as a player, um, now manager of the team that had the best record in all of baseball last year. And on last year's uh, June 5th game, they had Pride Night in San Francisco, and he wore this cap celebrating the LGBTQ community. And this was the first time that a major league team had ever used a, a rainbow-colored Pride logo on field. And Gabe has, has always been an outspoken supporter of the community, and um, we asked if he would send his cap to Cooperstown, and and he was more than willing to do it. So um, it just kind of makes me laugh when I was putting this together. It's kind of hard to believe the two kids from the same Hebrew school class at Dottoriel would end up in 
the jobs that we're in, but it's something that I, I take great pride in. I know he does as well. And uh, I'm excited to see where he takes, can't say I'm a Giants fan, but I'm a Gabe Kapler fan. And then uh, this next slide here, will give you just a little sense of the five Jewish Hall of Famers. And um, what's funny is going into today, um, we, we, we've talked already about Hank Greenberg and Sandy Koufax. Those are the, the two players who are in there. The other three are actually executives. So Marvin Miller, um, the head of the Major League Baseball Players Association, who just went in this past, uh, went in posthumously this past induction ceremony. He, uh, he was an incredibly influential person in the history of the game. And so he's really one of our most recent inductees. And then just a few years ago, uh, Bud Selig, the former commissioner of baseball uh, and former owner of the Milwaukee Brewers was in there. But it was interesting as I was doing a, an interview earlier today um, with, a, 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 interestingly, a, a reporter from The Reporter, a Jewish paper up here in, in upstate New York. Um, I referenced the four, hall, four Jewish Hall of Famers and he actually told me I was wrong, um, which is good to know. I'm still learning a lot. I've only been on the job here for eight months. But um, Barney Dreyfus actually was uh, the owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates in the, the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, pretty cool that there's there's now five Jewish men whose, na- whose plaques hang on the wall with hopefully more to come in, in the years to follow. So this last item here, I wanted to show because it's, it's to me just very, an interesting one. It's not accession. It's probably too small for you to see. I realize, I don't know how big you can see this on your screen, but um, this is not one of the 3 million documents that we have accessioned into our library. That's a pretty, crazy number when you think about what we have cataloged and, and put in here for the future, but it does sit proudly on my desk. This is a letter from Commissioner Selig uh, dated uh, September 21st, 2001, and it was sent to me um, and to every employee. We each got one individually throughout the country just 10 days after 9-11. And he really talks about how um, this is the, the role that baseball plays in, in a moment like that in American society coming back from 9-11 and, and really what baseball means to everybody in our country. Um, it just, to me, it, it's actually sitting, this letter sits on my desk here at the Hall of Fame. Like I said, it's not part of our collection, but it's part of my collection because it really does help you understand why the mission here at the Hall of Fame is so critical. It, it, what we do every day here, we really basically try to do three things. We connect generations, which ultimately is parents and children walking around hand in hand, grandparents learning about the history of the game. We want to honor excellence. And that's the part that a lot of people know about the actual hall of fame and the plaques on the, on the plaque gallery walls. And we preserve history. And, you know, most people probably don't realize that we're an independent entity a nonprofit separate from MLB that survives on, on donations and on um, the kindness of our members and, Every item that we've got in our collection, we don't pay for. It's donated by somebody who, who thinks, you know, this is an opportunity to, to preserve the history of our game. So um, we hope many of you will get a chance to make it up here to Cooperstown, get a chance to say hello to me while you're here. Um, hopefully, if you have any interest in getting involved in any way, you can check out our website, baseballhall.org. Um, there's lots of ways that you can get involved from being a member to a donor to just coming on out and visiting this incredible place. It's on everyone's bucket list. I say get it off the bucket list, put it on your to-do list. And uh, really hope we get a chance to see you out here. Please let me know if you make it. I will make it a point to come out and, and say hello. So wanted to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. I know there's lots of them. And I've already uh, given Doug and others a heads up that no question worries me. Anything you want to ask about the Hall of Fame or about my baseball career, my path here, I'm more than happy to answer. So thank you all very much for, uh, for being on here tonight. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Um, it's, a, it's actually a great tour. Coming from someone who, and I'm going to ask the first couple of questions, uh, your first visit to the Hall of Fame, what's your original memory? And once you got to move back there in a position of being the president, what's now the most impressive item there? Hmm. So my first visit was actually um, in 2001, uh, summer of 2001. My niece was born down in Brooklyn. My sister was living out there. And so my father and I took a, a day trip up here. Um, and got a chance to walk around and we found recently photos of of my first trip there. And it it's crazy. I mean, I guess what I remember most was just being overwhelmed by um, how many incredible things were there and and knowing that I couldn't I couldn't get through it in in a week, let alone whatever the four or five hours that we had. And we went down to Doubleday Field, which is um, a historic field on our on Main Street here in Cooperstown that is one of the oldest 
fields in the country and now oddly enough going to be the, the high school baseball field of my son. That's kind of hard to believe that they get to play their home games at double day. But um, those early memories were just kind of, I was a lot, I remember going to Jackie Robinson's plaque and Sandy Koufax's plaque and Tommy Lasorda's plaque and just wandering around with my father and, and taking it all in um, was just a really, obviously you never, you never imagined that you might actually then come back um, that just, to, and, and to be in this position to live in this town is kind of crazy. So the second part of your question, um, it is so hard to answer that. I, I actually have a, a little calendar reminder that goes off in my Outlook every day at three o'clock to, to get me up off out of my desk, away from my desk and into the museum and go look at something I haven't seen. And literally every day I walk in, I just, there, there's a, there's an incredible um, artifact we have just to pick one random one. There's, there's a, a, a bracelet that, that was made by Lou Gehrig for his wife that was basically all of his rings and, and trophies and awards all basically put into a, and I, I remember saying to our, uh, one of our curators, like, I mean, what would that even go for on the open market? A million dollars, five million, ten million dollars, like a literal one of a kind piece of Lou Gehrig's ring, World Series rings and trophies put into a pendant. And he's like, we don't, it's all priceless. There is no way to put a price tag on this stuff. And so that's what I think is just so cool. I could literally give you 50 items like that that have blown my mind since I started here. So the, the next one I'll go for is um, the two living members enshrined in the Hall of Fame. And they were invited to be on here tonight. I don't know because I haven't looked through the list to see if Sandy Koufax or Bud Selig are with us. Um, your memories of meeting either of them the first time, something special about um, those Jews that you have that connection to whose plaques now live on your walls? Um, yeah, I mean, Sandy Koufax is in so many ways what I think he, he, he was retired and in the Hall of Fame before I was born and yet um, is a name of somebody that just obviously what he did by not playing on Yom Kippur and, and, and what he means to the Jewish community and what he still means to the Jewish community. I, I do remember my first interaction with him was very, very brief. I was a reporter at the Dodgers and um, I remember asking him if he wanted to, I was going to, was writing for Dodgers.com at the time. And I said, would you have some time for some questions on Dodgers.com? And he looked at me very nicely and said, what if I don't want to be on Dodgers.com? And I said, okay, then, then we won't ask you any questions. Um, but he has been incredibly kind uh, in, in so many ways during my years with the Dodgers. Um, certainly as I've taken, every time my phone rings and it's it's him calling, I kind of, it, it's this surreal moment that, that, um, Obviously, he's just like anybody else, but he, he has this incredible um, aura about him that is just hard to hard to put into words, and it's still an honor every time I get a chance to talk to him. Um, and Commissioner Selig has really been um, a, a great ally of mine going back to my earliest days with the Dodgers. He, he certainly was great every time he would come out to Arizona in various capacities. And since I've taken over in this role, this past December, he actually helped chair one of the era committees we did that focused on early baseball, the pre-1950 group. And so we got a chance to be on a number of different um, Zoom calls and conversations with them as we helped kind of put together the ballot for that group. And then in the room, just the, the presence he carries of 50 years in the game. He loves the sport, almost unlike anybody you can imagine. As, as big a fan as any of us are, uh, Commissioner Selig is that and then some. And uh, and like I said, his, his letter said, we've got Koufax is on my wall right over here. I don't know if you can see it, but that's a, a picture of his first win over there. And right behind me on the other side is uh, Commissioner Selig's letter to me that I referenced earlier. So I feel very, very lucky that uh, I've had the chance to interact with both of them. So one more thing, we do have a representative of the Diamondbacks on tonight, someone you know pretty well, George Weiss. Um, I understand that they're from reading some of the bio that you're getting to the Hall of Fame um, had a lot to do with support that you had from your years with the Diamondbacks. You want to talk about what it was like to get the job as pres at the eighth president of the Baseball Hall of Fame? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, I can't, like I said, no, I, there's for some reason people in baseball don't really think of Cooperstown as an ending point. I don't know how to describe it, but it's not. It's not a thing that I ever remember anybody around the game saying. You know, maybe someday I'll go run marketing at the Hall of Fame, or I'll go do this at the Hall of Fame. And so I was actually driving to spring training one morning, and Jeff Idelson. Um, who was my predecessor here, he called and just said, hey, I got a crazy idea for you, but what would you think about potentially interviewing for my position? And I, I really didn't, I honestly, 
I didn't even know what to say. I just remember thinking like, I, I guess he's serious. So I should probably talk about it with my wife, but I'm not sure that I'm even qualified for this. And I came home and I mentioned it to my wife who, who's from Long Island. Her parents are still here. And um, I remember her saying, how would, how would we ever turn that down if you got something like that? Um, and then ultimately going through the interview process and getting a chance to interview with people like Cal Ripken Jr. and Commissioner Manfred and Hart's just some of the biggest names in, in, in baseball. Um, and then to have Jane Forbes Clark call and say, you know, I've spoken to the search committee and we want to make you the next president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. I just remember saying, I, I wish you could see my face right now. There's just a giant smile on it. It is not anything anybody would ever dream of growing up, but I feel very, very lucky that it's, it's come true for me. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this now over to Lou Rosenberg. Again, um, you know, my path and, and everyone's path of those that are members of the Baseball Softball Task Force. Uh, Lou is our official liaison with as staff liaison. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lou to handle the rest of the questions. First of all, thank you, Josh, so much. And we do have some questions. So, um, First one is, how involved is the commissioner's office in the Hall of Fame? Are you and the commissioner's office separate entities, or does the commissioner's office dictate how the Hall of Fame is run? It is, it is a great question, because I think very, most people I talk to think that the commissioner's office is somehow affiliated with us, and, and they really aren't. I mean, we, we are an independent 501c3, operated completely separate from them. Um, I answer to a board of directors, and the chairman of the board is Jane Forbes Clark, who's, whose grandfather um, started the Hall of Fame um, back in, in 1939. So we, we, we really do operate independently of them. Of course, we are honoring primarily um, Major League Baseball players, executives, umpires, um, and moments. And, and the majority of our artifacts certainly come from MLB games. So we're in touch with them all the time. I probably speak to somebody from MLB um, multiple times a week, but it's not, it's more just in a, either in a heads up or an advisory, hey, we've got a thought or a question for you. Um, we really do operate separately. And they've been, they've been kind donors in the past. They've certainly helped us um, with our endowment in various ways. They've been great donors in that regard. Um, but we, we fundraise on our own. We sell tickets. Obviously, we, we, we are in a lot of ways, both a museum, but also a, a tourist destination. So we, I would say the number one thing that brings people to Cooperstown is this, um, but it is completely separate of the, of the league offices and uh, they're, they're great to us, but, but not in charge of us. <laughs> um, we have quite a few Met fans with us tonight. So one question that came up, is there anything in the hall from uh, Jake DeGrom's last year? Ooh, that is a good question. Last year, I don't think there is, but I will tell you, you know what? Um, I will tell you, if anybody, if you go on baseballhall.org and you, you navigate over to the museum collection, you can actually, there's a forward facing database that allows you to search. I wouldn't say it's anywhere close to the 40,000, but as we're slowly redoing our website this year, we hope that we'll be able to have all of it in there that you can search um, and you can put, you'll get lost in it for hours at a time looking at the cool stuff that's in there. So anything that would be related to Jacob DeGrom, all you get to do is search his last name and you can find it in there. Um how is it determined, like, a, let's say a player like Mike Piazza, do you think he goes in as a Dodger or a Met? And who determines when a player has played for multiple teams? Very good question. Yeah, very good question. Um, so it, it is ultimately the decision of the Halls. We, we, we kind of reserve the right to, to make that decision if it's kind of a, a toss-up. Um, at the same time, sorry, I'm seeing, I'm seeing what looks like a, a Wookiee in the bottom right of my screen. That's pretty funny. Somebody, somebody is not on camera and it just grabbed my eye. Um, so what we, what we try to do is we'll work with the player. Certainly if the player feels a certain kinship for a city, they'll tell us, look, I really feel like the majority of my success and, and, and what I'd like to go in is, is a Met, for example. We, if, they, if somebody said, let's say they played one year at a team and they, they thought, well, I was born and raised in New York, even though I played my whole career in in Arizona, I'd really like to go in with a, with a Yankee cap. We obviously would say, look, that, that really doesn't make sense. And then ultimately, if there's, if there's a player, and in several cases there have been players who have made uh, contributions in a number of different cities, they can, they can opt to go in without a, a logo on their cap. So someone like Greg Maddox has gone in without one. A number of people in recent years as free agency has kind of allowed players to bounce around. But um, 
Piazza, um, it's funny. He was my, my very first job when I was starting at the Dodgers full time. I got, I graduated from, from Indiana on a Friday. It was the day he got traded, got in the car, drove cross country, started my full time job on Monday morning. And my job was to help take down all the billboards and bus, bus shelters and ads all around Los Angeles for Mike Piazza because he had just been traded basically two days before I started full time. So I actually shared that with him. Uh, I was just this past weekend at the the uh, unveiling of Tom Seaver's statue at City Field and Mike Piazza was there and I had a chance to catch up with him for a bit and I shared that story with him and he didn't think it was, it was funny as I did, but I did think that my first job being uh, eliminating him from from everything. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions about visiting the hall. How much time would you recommend is it a day? Is it two? Do they come multiple days? What's your best suggestion for that? Yeah. So, I mean, I really do think it is very hard to do everything in a day. Um, you can, you certainly can, but you're going to be flying through it pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, we have three floors, two floors of, of two and a half floors of museum exhibits and then the plaque gallery. And we've got a film that you can watch that takes 20 minutes. That is one of the most, I mean, it, I've watched it 20 times and I tear up every time I see it. Um, and then of course, just spending time around Cooperstown I and mean, main street is truly like a time machine. You walk around and you feel like you're, you've, you've shot back multiple decades. So I would definitely recommend a weekend. I think if you come in on a Friday and spend two nights there and you get a chance to spend Saturday and most of Sunday there, you'll get a really good taste of it. But we obviously have members who have been coming back for years and they haven't, they haven't even scratched the surface of reading every label, seeing every exhibit, going through all the interactives. Um, there's just, there's so much to do. And, um, we have public facing library. People come in all the time and do research for book projects or they just want to sit down and, and, and research and all of those things. We're kind of we're basically back to the way we were in 2019, where all the things that were open before the pandemic are now open again. And we're excited that it's going to feel like a real normal year again. So a Cardinals fan is anticipating, and I kind of agree with them, that Yadier Molina and Albert Pujols will probably go into the Hall of Fame together in five years. Um, how early can you book tickets to be part of the ceremony? So interestingly, booking the tickets is actually, so if it, there's, there's memberships that allow you. Um, and again, if you just check out on our website, you'll see the different levels and what they all get. But ultimately, if you want a seat at the induction ceremony, you don't have to do that that far in advance. Um, if you want to just pull up a blanket and be on the lawn, you don't have to do that at all in advance. You can just show up that day. Um, I'd say the housing is more of a challenge that weekend. Um, and, and you can book. Um, there were people, from what I understand, booking Derek Jeter induction weekend five years in advance. They were calling up the hotels in town and trying to lock in their dates for five years later. And that often does happen when you have a big name retire and you know for certain they're going to get in. Um, that, 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 that has been known to happen. And there are plenty of hotels in town that will actually take your reservation and, uh, and lock you in. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions and then we're going to conclude. Um, Jacob Steinmetz, he was the first Orthodox Jew to be drafted this past year. Do we have any memorabilia from him in the hall? We don't. Um, he, he, he got drafted literally about a month before, not even, I think three weeks before I left the D-backs. Um, I was pretty excited that that, um, that, that happened. Um, but I, we do not yet have any memorabilia from him. And um, it's a good reminder that it's probably worth following up with him. Um, we, we tend to, for the most part, we tend to wait until someone gets to the big leagues um, for something like that. It also, what we do when we look for artifacts is something that tells a story. So I don't know in that instance whether it would be uh, his, his yarmulke or what, what, what piece of memorabilia would help tell that story. Um, but uh, it, we have not yet asked him for anything. A final question. Um, do you collaborate with the Negro League Museums? And in what capacity? We do. And um, it actually gives me a perfect chance to mention our, our, our next big exhibit. For those of you that didn't see, we had a big announcement last week in the New York Times that we're going to be spending the next two years creating a, an exhibit that we focus on the Black baseball experience, really because the one that we currently have was opened uh, in 1997 when Jackie Robinson had a 20, the 50th anniversary of breaking the color barrier. And we just passed the 75th last week. So we announced this big initiative. And with that, um, we're collaborating with all sorts of, of, whether it's the Negro Leagues Museum, Jackie Robinson Foundation, the, the Smithsonian, Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association, a number of different institutions. But for those who haven't been to the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City, it is an unbelievable place. 
that um, just it, it tells an incredible story of what took place really between 1920 and 19 in the 60s when the, when the Negro Leagues um, really stopped functioning. But uh, they focus really basically on that little window. And I think what we're going to try to do is do our best to tell the story of how how black baseball has evolved from the very earliest days of a guy named Bud, Bud Fowler, who's getting inducted this year, actually born and raised here in Cooperstown, all the way up through modern day players and some of the best players, Mookie Betts or Byron Buxton, you name it. There's a, there's a trail of, of incredible stories throughout uh, history, and that'll be the next big exhibit that we unveil in, in about two years. Well, Josh, this was absolutely unbelievable. I thank you. I think we could have gone on for another hour with with because there's the Hall of Fame. I've been there. It's so interesting. And you're right. It is stepping back into time. And um, to wrap things up for tonight, I would like to introduce our chairperson of Project Baseball from New Jersey, uh, Mr. Mark Ratner, who's been with us pretty much since day one. Thank you, Lou. Um, and thank you to everybody for taking the time tonight. And thanks so much to Josh Rawwich for that fantastic presentation. Um, as Lou mentioned, I've been involved with uh, JNF and Project Baseball since 2007. Uh, and uh, as at that time, I, I first met Peter Kurz, the miracle worker in Israel, and uh, met Ami Baran as well as part of the Professional Baseball League over there, which lasted one will be gone season. I'm not sure whether Josh you have anything from the IBL in the uh, in the Hall of Fame. But in any event, uh, it was always uh, I've been a baseball fan for a long, long time. And some of my best baseball memories revolve around Team Israel. Uh, I was down in Florida from 2012 for the qualifying tournament, which they did not get in. And in 2016 in Brooklyn, when they succeeded. And then in Germany in 2019 for the European classic uh, European tournaments, which were incredible. And to watch the team beat the German team uh, a day or two around the anniversary of the 1972 Munich massacre, you know, gave, gave us all chills. In any event, uh, we hope you all enjoyed the program. You've heard the various requests this evening to keep Project Baseball in mind with your, uh, as you think about donating to JNF. I think that if you, uh, Heard some of the things that are happening and some of the fields that are now being developed is a real future for baseball in Israel, thanks to the hard work of the folks over there. Uh, so if you have the uh, uh, inclination and you want to contribute, I think that there will be put on the screen uh, a notice, uh, some information how to, how to do that again, just as a lasting, as a, as an ending thought for the evening. So thanks again to everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. I know it's late on the East Coast, so thank you for staying up with us. And Josh, I hope we get to meet in person soon. And I, I wish to see a lot of you people in person soon. But anyways, have a fantastic night. And thank you again for joining us. Take care.